Hey everyone, today I've got some interesting AI filmmaking tools and techniques for you. One that just might be the future of cinematography and the other really solves the problem of those like static talking AI characters. Okay, lots to cover, let's dive in. So we've talked about Gaussian splatting a lot on the channel recently. And in case you missed it or you need like the quickest explainer of all time, uh, Gaussian splatting basically allows for a lot of pictures of a thing to be taken and then stitched together to create a 3D environment. There's a lot more to it, but that is what it does at its most basic form. There are tons of different uses for it, everything from video games to VR environments, but one of the most novel uses I've seen of it in recent times comes from a channel called Bad Decision Studios, which kudos on that name, by the way. So they came up with this idea that instead of going to a location and shooting a bunch of photographs, that they could try to create a Gaussian splat out of iconic film scenes. And surprisingly, it works. So you should definitely check out Bad Decision's video. It is linked below. For their first shot, they went and grabbed the opening of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which is a helicopter shot featuring the Overlook Hotel, ran that through a Gaussian splat. And indeed, after what I can only presume was probably a ton of rendering time, they now have a you know 3D camera fly through of the Overlook Hotel. Now, a couple of things with this. For one, you can't go behind the Overlook Hotel because the original shot does not do so. Another thing that I find just endlessly fascinating about Gaussian splats is the fact that like you can zoom in on aspects of your location. Essentially, you could pretty much just recompose the entire path of that camera tracking shot in post. There are of course a number of limitations, but I do have my own kind of duct tape version of this because of course I do, so that you can try it out if you don't have a beefy GPU. But something to keep in mind as Bad Decision points out in their video is that you need shots with rotational movement yet very little subject movement happening within the frame. For example, they found this shot from the opening of Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, and this is actually a perfect example for a shot in which the actors have very little movement as the camera rotates around, giving us a fairly nice 360 of the room itself. So feeding that in and creating a splat out of it gives us this, which is kind of insane. It's, you know, you have a completely controllable camera that you can recompose this shot with. Yeah, the zoom in is really, really impressive. Now, there are, again, some problems. One, you end up with some artifacting, and you can see right here where things get a little bit sloppy. You really do want to aim for sequences where characters are really, really moving minimally. But what's even cooler is that the guys figured out that you could bring that Gaussian splat into like Unreal Engine and relight the whole thing. So yeah, it's pretty brilliant, but it does take a very specific shot. I mean, even taking the OG Gaussian splat of Keanu Reeves in the Matrix, you know, the Neo bullet time sequence. If you try to splat that, it just kind of comes out a blurry garbage mess. Whereas a shot of Hogwarts from, I think this is Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, the best one, um, this works perfectly because it is mostly a fly through and obviously the castle isn't moving. So all of that is super cool, but of course there is that inherent problem that you can't have a character moving in a Gaussian splat, but that might not be the case for much longer. But first, I should point out that it doesn't necessarily have to be rotational shots. It can actually be like horizontal dolly shots as well as Daniel Scale tried out with the gold room sequence from The Shining. I don't know why The Shining keeps popping up in all these Gaussian splat tests. It's something kind of off-putting about that. The other kind of surreal thing is the fact that uh, the Gaussian splat kept all of the background characters in the gold room, but it kind of ghosted out on Jack Torrance, which is, yeah, that's like slightly unnerving, isn't it? Even the splats know you've always been the caretaker. So if you want to try a homebrew version of this technique out, and this is really stupid, but it does kind of work, um, grab your phone and download the Luma Labs app. It is totally free. Since the Luma app does do Gaussian splatting, all you have to do is take your phone and pointed at your screen. So trying it out with one of my favorite fantasy locations, the Gates of Argonoth from Fellowship of the Rings, uh, and literally again, pointing my phone at my screen, which got us this. And I gotta admit, it's a little bit on the janky side, but I kind of like the fact that it freaked out and kind of created this like weird, like Valhalla cosmos uh, in the background. I thought that was kind of neat. Now granted, it is more of a parallaxing effect than it is necessarily a 3D effect. Um, but you know, you have some zoom controls over it, but I do think that there is a use case for 
for it in, like you could use it as a backplate in a scene for a 3D composition. Again, if you rotate behind it, it's all just kind of a giant mess, which actually looks super abstract and kind of cool just on its own. But of course the real fun is just go out and use Luma for its intended purpose, you know, go out into the real world and capture some environments. But rolling back to the issue of creating movement within the Gaussian splat, well, we have a paper out now called 4D Gaussian Splatting for Real-Time Dynamic Scene Rendering. So that is movement and action happening within a Gaussian splat, including a poodle who has no idea what's going on and just wants a piece of steak. Uh, the clips are very short, which sort of leads me to believe that we're kind of more in the animated GIF area, but like all things AI, that is the first step. So I don't doubt within, you know, four months, it will be dramatically improved from where it is. So this is technology that very much feels to me like it might be the beginning of a new style of cinematography. The idea obviously isn't new. We have motion capture and virtual cameras, but I can't help but think that this is something that actors would really love as they don't have to wear stupid mocap suits and can actually interact within a physical environment. Even if it's going to be some time before we get there, we're already seeing some interesting filmmaking experiments using Luma Labs. And even though this isn't the hottest take, it is very clear that 3D and AI are going to be peanut butter and jelly. So start brushing up on those Blender tutorials. Now that said, moving from 3D to 2D, here is a little tool bash workflow that I put together to kind of get over that whole whole kind of static AI character thing. So this whole thing kicked off via a tweet that I saw from Theobald Zamora comparing the various lip sync models that are out. Hello, I am Eve, the lead actress of Fictions.ai. Hello, I am Eve, the lead actress of Fictions.ai. Of the four of them, I do like Sad Talker the most. That's the bottom right one, although they all do have little problems here and there. So I wanted to try it out with this shot that we generated up in Moon Valley last week. That video is linked down below if you want to check it out. Now, there are some problems with the shot. Um, like, for example, our uh, background character here just kind of teleports out of the scene for some reason, but we'll address that. And you know what? I just realized what I liked about this shot. It's the Michael Bay shot. It's the camera with the long lens that is moving, creating a parallaxing background. Yeah, the Michael Bay shot, it always works. So by design, this is something that anyone can do. So the first thing that I started with was obviously the voice. I used Eleven Labs. This is just one of their stock voices. It's a free voice. Her name is Kimber. From there, I loaded up Sad Talker, which you can use for free. It is kind of being hammered right now. So I did end up paying, I don't know, what, three bucks or whatever uh, to duplicate the space. Anyhow, um, I brought in a screenshot from the video. Now this was the thumbnail that I previously used. So there is a slight amount of generative fill over here, but doesn't seem to affect anything. Our initial Moon Valley output and then the audio. Now, one thing I should add is that you'll probably want to have the still mode clicked on. That does minimize the chance that your character has kind of a jerky head movement that I did tend to run across. For example, leaving that clicked off did get us this. Yeah, that kind of like juke to the side. That doesn't really work. So I uh, definitely have that clicked on. I think that you just end up with more consistent results that way. So what's funny is that our reference video doesn't actually bias that much. Uh, the output that I got was this. They wiped out everything. How do we even stand a chance? Which is for the most part, kind of your typical AI lip sync to video, right? So to get around that, I just went over to Runway ML and used the green screen tool. As it turns out, Runway ML has a lot of other tools besides Gen 1 and Gen 2. You could roto this yourself if you wanted to, but I mean, honestly, it just makes it so easy. You just kind of put a bunch of points on, boom, you're done, you're rotoed. So the trick from here was taking this and bringing it into Premiere. Now, you don't have to use Premiere. You can use the very free DaVinci Resolve or CapCut or really any other video editor. They all pretty much have this tool. You'll wanna find whatever it is that will remove green screens. And from here, all you really need to do is maneuver your character on top of your other character. Sort of just try to find roughly where they line up. From there, find your masking tool. So this is basically just cutting out a hole on top of whatever video is on top of the other video. Now I'll admit this is the part that gets a little tedious. As you can see, as we scrub through, our head is just kind of floating there. Uh, well, you can actually still see our background head. So uh, what you need to do is go through and literally keyframe each one out. So in Premiere, you just kind of hit this position button and then move a frame or two and then readjust the position and then 
you know, hit your keyframe again and on and on it goes. Ultimately, you'll end up with this. I'll admit I got a little sloppy with the keyframing. There's only so much time I have for these videos, uh, but we're not done yet anyways. So my longtime trick for kind of baking various AI elements together has long been Kyber. So to me, Kyber is a real secret sauce. Yes, it can do sort of those warpy, hallucinogenic, trippy things. I think one of its secret superpowers is this transform an existing video in which you can take a video and then apply essentially a Kyber filter over it. Taking our output, and I think I just put woman in a combat uh, area and uh, giving it the style of cinematic ended up giving us this. They wiped out everything. How do we even stand a chance? And that's our closing shot where Kyber has kind of smoothed over a lot of the inconsistencies. The other bonus with Kyber is that you can then take that and upscale it up to 4K. Now, some of you might be saying that is a lot of steps and yeah, I can't necessarily argue that, but so is real animation. I'm sure at some point we will have a one button solution, but for now, I think this works pretty well. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. I thank you for watching. My name is Tim.